Well, welcome and thank you all for joining us today for this very special celebration of our 2021 Conservation Leadership Programme Team Award winners. My name is Stuart Patterson and I'm the Executive Manager of the Conservation Leadership Programme, which from now on I'll just refer to as, as CLP. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with CLP, we're a capacity building programme that's delivered through a partnership between BirdLife International, Fauna and Flora International and the Wildlife Conservation Society. And we award funding, training, internships, ongoing support um, to, to early and mid-career conservationists globally. Now, this is the first time since I think it was about 2006 um, that we've brought people together to celebrate our award winners. And it's our first virtual award ceremony. So we're delighted to have so many of you who can join us today from around the world. As you'll notice, we've set the Zoom video settings to focus on specific people today. Um, so whilst we can't see all of you in the audience, please do use the chat facility, um, our audience, to let us know who you are, uh, where you're, you're calling in from, and importantly, to congratulate our award winners. So you can see most of the team leaders here, um, and, but we're also celebrating all team members, some of whom aren't on the screen, but are in the audience. Now, also on the screen, you can see some distinguished and experienced conservation leaders who you may recognize. Uh, and these are the CEOs of the CLP partnership organizations. So Patricia, Zarita, Mark Rose, and Dr. Christian Samper, if you'd like to wave, show us your hands. Um, you've been so supportive to the next generation of conservation leaders. We're really grateful you can be with us here today. And um, we're grateful that you'll be able to offer your insights in response to some of the questions posed by our new grantees. And also joining us is Dr. Blanca Huertas, who is two time CLP award winner, and she'll be reflecting on her own career to date and how CLP has supported her to get here. So Blanca, if you'd like to give us a wave too. So our exceptional award winners, they'll be soon be undertaking 22 projects. And with their teams, they'll be working together to conduct vital research and conservation action on some of the world's most threatened species. They've already come quite a long way through the CLP application process, because this year we received about 360 applications, which went through three rigorous review stages. And we're grateful to our expert reviewers and our esteemed award selection committee for making the final decision on these 22 projects. Now, in undertaking these projects, our 15 first-time award winners who have been granted up to $15,000 each for projects lasting up to one year will get ex important experience of doing field work, of engaging with stakeholders and managing their own projects, but they'll also be developing their own leadership skills. And our seven continuation award winners who will be receiving between $25,000 and $50,000 each for projects lasting up to three years will be scaling up on their previous CLP-funded work and deliver outcomes that are sustainable and influence conservation on a larger scale. And as they support, as they start this work, we'll be supporting their leadership development through an eight week online training course, which is gonna start in July. But all team members will also be able to access mentoring, coaching, and support from the CLP management team, the CLP partnership, but also through the CLP alumni network. Now, CLP is all about collaborations, partnership, and teamwork. And we're the product of a really, really successful conservation partnership between three of the best regarded conservation organizations. It's BirdLife, FFI, and WCS. And for 35 years, the partnership has supported some really remarkable achievements undertaken by our alumni. But this year, we pass a, a really important milestone. It's actually the year that we've, we've successfully granted $10 million to conservation projects. So you can see the CLP partnerships come a long way since the first grants were awarded way back in 1986. And through the connections made within the CLP alumni network, many of the 3000 conservationists that we've supported have really bonded with each other. They've given each other guidance throughout their work, but also friendships spanning across borders and age groups. We know it's been a really challenging 18 months 
and we can all appreciate how much and how important these connections matter. And in recent years, our alumni have been giving back to CLP by supporting us with trainings and reviews. And I really wanted to appreciate the whole CLP alumni network who are here today. You really are an amazing bunch. Of course, all this can only happen with an exceptional team, which includes the CLP Executive Committee. So thanks to, to Marianne, to Caleb, and to, to uh, Lenka for the support and guidance with the CLP, but also to the amazing CLP management team who work tirelessly to deliver the program and who engage almost daily with all our grantees, but especially um, this year's winners. It's a massive undertaking for such a small team. So thank you, Christina, Sherilyn, Kate, Henry, and Leela. And finally, I'd like to say a huge thanks to Arcadia a Charitable Fund of Elizabeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin, without whom these awards, but also the whole, all of the work of CLP really wouldn't be possible. So thank you so much, uh, Francesca and the team at Arcadia. We've got a really exciting schedule lined up today. We've got a keynote talk from Blanca and some Q and A's with our CEOs uh, in response to questions from our new grantees. And for those of you who can stay, we've got a networking session and Kate's gonna be providing a link to a separate Zoom room where we'll be able to, to meet and, and greet and say hi to everybody, uh, even those in the audience. But first we'd like to show a quick video of the projects that we're supporting this year and highlight their great work. So do please continue to use the chat facility uh, to congratulate our grantees as they come up on the screen. That'd be wonderful, thanks. Over to you, Kate. Take this as an excellent opportunity for each one of us to explore and develop our skills and become better conservation researchers.
a brilliant video. I hope you all enjoyed watching that and learning a little bit more about our award-winning projects. And congratulations again to all of you. Well, next, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Blanca Huertas, who's a senior curator of butterflies at the Natural History Museum in London. And Blanca's received project funding from CLP in 2005 and 2010 uh, to conduct work in Colombia. And she's become a mentor and role model to, to many early career conservationists. So we hope that um, she'll be give you, able to give our, this year's award winners an idea of, of what it's like um, and what kind of experiences they might encounter over the next months and years. Thank you, Blanca. Thank you, Stuart. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, let's see. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Wait, I got it. There we go. Yeah, it's looking good. Yeah, all okay. Thank you. Looking good. Right, well, hello everybody. Thanks to Stuart for the introduction. It's indeed a pleasure, an honor, and a true privilege for me to be addressing to you all alumni on the new members of the alumni of the CELP program, and also to the representatives of those organizations who has made possible the work of the CLP and what have passed to many of us. I was born in Colombia, one of the most biodiversity countries in the world. And I grew in the capital city of Bogota, surrounded by buildings, but also by mountains. So with the influence of, of the forest and my family, I became interested in nature and in science since I was a child. Today is a life-changing day for all of you receiving the, one of the CLP awards. I've been there in 2005, as Stuart said, and also in 2010 with my team uh, as winners. Uh, we didn't realize uh, this one will be more than a word, but it's going to, it, for us, it's been a lifetime bond with very special people, which is truly engaged with the protection and conservation of the planet, like everybody is in here today. So we were lucky to, lucky to support, uh, to receive not just the financial support, but the mentoring and the training from the CLP program for this, my project uh, called Jare, uh, which is the endangered species in one of the mountains in Colombia. This is, this is the team uh, I gathered during my university years and uh, we applied, we were confident to apply for support from the CLP uh, um, to, to, to give us uh, the to support or, or um, or a willingness to, to make a difference in the forest of Colombia. Fieldwork is a great experience for all of us and it's gonna be for all of you, but the job opportunities were limited. And obviously in a science we was in the new state, in the new stages in those days about 15 years ago, like conservation and in a country of social instability that we have in, at the moment or in those days too. So I moved to the UK with the same passion for nature for forests and mainly uh, on my topic, which is butterflies. So I'm now working at the Natural History Museum here in London for about 15 years. Uh, and I'm sure uh, many of the skills I have got from all of this mentoring with the, with the CLP has helped me a lot because my job involves a lot of, a lot of the skills that you get on those trainings. So during my job, uh, I really enjoy my job. It's obviously I miss the forest, uh, but uh, no day is the same. And I spend most of my time in the collection surrounded by the millions of butterflies from all over the world. And uh, as a scientist, obviously my work shouldn't be, it's, not, it's gonna be meaningless if I do not let others to know about our discoveries and to engage with the public about the science that we do. So also all of those skills came from the university years when we talked to communities in the field. Now I'm facing public and millions of people, even media, uh, to engage with the conservation from my front. Uh, we involve obviously in this process to, to talk to people, to tell about our discoveries, children, adults, uh, teachers, farmers, government, academics, anyone who will become part of the conservation team that we need to achieve uh, through results. 
Conservation in the planet is an ultimate goal for everybody who is in actually interested. But we need to cover all of the fronts, as I was saying, for many of the stakeholders, and it's very complex to do it. So when we go to field work, and once field work is a sponsor, uh, is great, but all of that material come actually to biological collections where I'm working from this side, I'm helping conservation from this side. And all of these materials become the source and the primary a resource for for doing books, field works, and other materials for education that is going to help for learning and for training, as you see in this what I call the virtual circle of conservation. Then all of these materials are going to train people, which are going to join the army of conservationists and help with the monitoring and the citizen science, increasing the data and all of those big, uh, big uh, databases that we have in the museums and other research institutions. Ultimately, all of those analyses are done by the ecologists and by other kind of uh, scientists, even obviously conservationists. But is uh, that data is going to fit onto the uh, government policies and to take the ultimate actions of protecting big pieces of land and again, for us, for scientists, all of that data, all of that information is going to uh, make a filter to where are the best places to go for field work now that we have so limited resources these days uh, for that. So museums and other research institutions becomes the lab for conservation and to study and to study global changes such as the biodiversity loss and the predicting extinctions. With museum data, we have been able to fit the IUCN red list checklists and also have been able to work uh, producing the list of the extinct species of Singapore and now working with the endangered species of Colombia. Here, you just got an example of one of the Brazilian species which is vulnerable and extinctions. Again, doing with all of the expertise gone from all of these years on field work, but also working uh, uh, with museum collections. Of course, all of this data is very important. All of the data that you get through all of your projects must be available and usable for other people in other countries. That's what we're doing also in the museum, bringing all of this uh, data available and uh, addressing big societal issues like climate change, habitat loss and food provisions that ultimately translate all of this scientific complex information into more friendly language, but for people to understand and also for governments to understand. Those are some of the little, uh, some of the species I've been uh, uh, happy to describe during some of the years working with the CLP project funded. Uh, we miss those brown little jobs in the field. So museums and the post post field work work is very important to, to see more in detail things that we maybe can miss when we're working. So there are many important superheroes out there working, uh, saving the planet, working from field work in the community and in communities. Uh, but as, um, and always obviously surviving all of the really tough bits of the, of the uh, field work. But we have also like in the movies, we have a, uh, people helping from the headquarters. So we are the people of the headquarters sitting now behind desks, uh, like museums, universities, all of these NGOs, organizations, people like Christian and, and Mark in here and, uh, uh, and Patricia, they helping from there, uh, monitoring, the, helping, uh, supporting the people which is actually in the field, the true heroes. Uh, obviously, uh, the conservation also is important. I just put this as a, as a really very quick uh, tribute to one of our field guides who fed us on all of the expeditions and it's very important, but sadly passed away very recently, which has been a big loss for us because he was our field guide. So I only have the opportunity to travel in Colombia, very limited, obviously being in the capital, but with the expedition supported by the CLP, I have the opportunity to have a wider vision of my own country, to travel to different places and visit different uh, remote areas, pristine forests, see really unique specimens, uh, organisms, and uh, things that are rare to find that people don't see. And those unique moments were the ones who actually spark my interest in the conservation and urge me to let others to know what's out there and what is hidden in the project in the in the forests. So working with communities, uh, with work community based projects, give us a very good uh, reconnection with people, with the actual 
gardens of the forests and with nature. And also for us, it was very important to create a sense of belonging and pride to those organisms that people rarely see on the forest, but they don't, don't, don't even know exists. This is a this is a lovely example of the Jarigius broadfinch, which was a bird that we discovered in one of the expeditions of the CLP, and also uh, it was unknown for science, and is now one of the prides of the region as well. Uh, the brown butterfly you saw, one of the brown butterflies you saw, is the the, the Jarigius butterfly, and thanks to all of that data of knowing endangered species or new species and all of the data we brought from from the field, this uh, area in Colombia because a national park. So CLP and all of the sponsors from all of the organizations and individuals who are helping with this project are actually part of this big achievement, which is protecting a large piece of uh, land, not just protecting the bird and the butterfly, but making an umbrella and protect all of the rest of the forests out there in Colombia. This project also left a big uh, a legacy on the forest and on reforestation uh, in this area. And we are seeing the, the, pro uh, the results these days. So if you visit the area, you still see people talking about the reforestation project. So getting not only the necessary monetary support from CLP, but also the skills and the training and that why the vision was really, really important in boosting the project achievements and actually path a, a new generation of, uh, of conservationists, which many of my colleagues from these expeditions are, we are now working in different organizations. I'm still collaborating with some of the CLP alumni, which is very nice. I'm sharing the expertise. I don't know much about modeling of distributions. I know a little bit, but uh, we go one of the experts, uh, Jorge Velasquez, which is also a CLP alumni, working together in a project uh, protecting the butterflies, endemic butterflies of Colombia. And we have received support from the government in here and also from institutions in Colombia. So no, all is bed of roses and you will confront uh, uh, difficult situations that uh, I can't do anymore. And all of those challenges working in conservation, in conservation science um, spring to mind for me. Uh, most people think is the lack of resources, the biggest problem. But looking behind and being on those sides of the conservation, I feel it's very important to look into the limitations in capacity. Why people like me or like some of you at the start of our career, we cannot secure support, even so there are organizations willing to do it. We have major, major barriers, like for example, language is one of those. Uh, but on the other hand, we can see this as a positive thing because when we are in our countries, we can also help with the conservation in our own language. Uh, Non-English speakers obviously is complicated. Uh, the unstable security in our countries can be a barrier also. And also the low prospects on career development. And here I said something we were just talking at the beginning is uh, it's interesting to see how uh, the, the percentage of women living in conservation is so low still after all of those years I've been in conservation. We still, uh, we have still obviously people like Patricia and other, and other really good figures, but we need more people going into those positions, leadership positions in, in, uh, within the conservation career. Obviously for people on the age or, or the intentions of forming a family, that is also an important barrier to think about in conservation because going to the field for a long time is complicated also with people with responsibilities. So, well, we've been exposed to all of these ch challenges and in my own experience, uh, we, I have become more confident. You have to become more resilient. Um, in my opinion, and in very personal opinion, I, I become more supportive to people who actually has those barriers and all of these, uh, especially people on early career and young conservationists. The networking opportunities of the CLP have been really important. All of the training they have done, all of the international events reconnect us and help us to share that expertise, that support, and uh, keep, keep building a really powerful network of people people working in conservation. I'm sorry, I didn't pass. So the, no, no, everything is in the dark side. Sorry, I didn't move the, the photo. So yeah, it, there is a very big dark side, and, but it's very important that the bigger and the more diverse teams uh, of people working together to, towards the protection of habitats with the same aims will attract, the, all of these big teams attract attention for many, many, many sectors and will ultimately attract in, um, investment in those 
in those projects. So the CEP has been fundamental, fundamental for many of us to see us growing as conservationists and all of the efforts are very, very huge from them, but we need obviously the support from all of the organizations to all of the other organizations behind, behind the conservation and uh, make this obviously all of the conservation, make it possible for everybody. We are facing a, a, um, a difficult time for the pandemic, but it's just it's just wanted to say, I don't have the answers for this, but obviously we have uh, difficult times, but just to say it's an opportunity, a unique opportunity to all of us to rethink the organizations, the individuals, how are we achieving conservation in, in, in this moment in the world? So I invite everybody again to to work with everybody together, to involve lots of stakeholders and your projects. And obviously I wish you all the best with the start of this new adventure. And I, and I really, really congratulate you because this is an amazing uh, network that uh, has made a difference in the life of many of us. Thank you. And I will leave oh. you with sort of, sorry, I will leave you with sort of the acknowledgements uh, for, for the project. Sorry, I forgot that this slide. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Thanks so much, Blanca, for your, your warm, warm words of encouragement for our new grantees and also for highlighting you know, the importance of the data that's being collected and how that contributes to conservation action, but also the importance of working with, with stakeholders and supporting future leaders. Um, if anyone in our audience has got any questions for Blanca, please do use the, the Q&A facility in Zoom or the chat box, um, as there'll be an opportunity to ask Blanca questions later in the, in the networking session. Um, after we've closed this main session where Black, uh, Kate will post a link to that. Well, next up is our, our Q&A session with the CEOs um, of the, the partnership organizations. Uh, we're really grateful for, for Patricia uh, from BirdLife, from Mark, from FFI and uh, Christian from WCS for joining us. We've got a number of excellent questions lined up from our award winners. Uh, and the first three questions are posed uh, to, each, uh, to, to all the CEOs as a panel. Um, and then after that, we'll have specific questions for each of you uh, individually. And our first question is from Karishma Pradham, who's a team leader of a hornbill project in India. Now, unfortunately, I think Karishma's uh, got some connectivity issues due to a cyclone. So Kate's going to ask the question on, uh, on her behalf. Okay, so um, the question from Krishma is, um, what have been the major shifts in conservation approaches you have observed and been a part of? And what do you think will be the key focus area for the coming years? And that one is uh, for Patricia to lead on, please. Great. Well, first of all, congratulations to all of the winners. It's fantastic to see all of you guys with your, your great projects and making strands on helping us protect all of this wonderful nature. And Blanca, what a testimony of what CLP is um, and how important it is for us uh, organizations who are involved in CLP to keep pushing for this. Building capacity is not easy and it's not easy to raise money for. But it's something that I think both uh, all of us really as uh, WCS, FFI and BirdLife are incredibly committed to keep pushing and ensuring that CLP goes beyond um, all these years that we have been working on. And fantastic to know that we have um, achieved the 10 million mark. Um, so what are the big shifts that I have seen? Uh, a couple actually. Uh, there's a lot more prominence of the talk of climate change. And I think we are, uh, if anything, we have to make sure that we, uh, the people who are interested and, and, and concerned about the protection of nature, um, we don't necessarily lose the space uh, of how important the loss of biodiversity uh, is to the planet and to our own survival. I think we have been seeing this through the pandemic. Um, but also to, for people to acknowledge that we're living a dual crisis, that climate and biodiversity go hand in hand, that they are two sides of the same coin and that we have to tackle them together. I think the other key thing on the years that I have been working on conservation is uh, the role that local communities and indigenous people play um, and, and how important it is to empower them and work with them, learn from them, um, understand uh, their vision and their heritage um, and look for solutions that are 
um, that in many, many cases can be born from them and that can be scaled up and in many cases can be cheaper and more achievable uh, than other solutions that end up being parachuted. And I would say the last thing um, from my side is this importance of um, that Blanca said, um, inclusivity and, and diversity and uh, how important it is that we look into a lot more um, better. Um, and that is led uh, from people from the South. I was really proud when I saw the, the list of people that are participating in, in, in this ceremony that we are three Latinos from South America coming in together with Blanca, Cristian and myself. Um, and I think we need more of that. I mean, no offense, Mark, I love you. Like, you know that I do. I know, I know, I know. No offense taken, Patricia, <laughs> no offense taken. But we definitely need to have more people from the South, more women leading. It does make a difference. And, um, and, I, and I think it is changing slowly, but it is. And I think CLP and building up that capacity of, of uh, leaders from developing countries and women leaders, as well as um, local communities and local indigenous people is incredibly important in that process. Thank you, Patricia. Mark, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, I think I think the, the world is very much a changing place at the moment. And I'd endorse everything that Patricia says. But, you know, conservation has become a, a very broad church and it, it needs to be if we're going to integrate it in all levels of society. But the good news is, is that we're, we're pushing at a part open door now, even before this pandemic at the last WEF conference, there was talk of biodiversity and climate change linked together. And I think that's the first time, first World Economic Forum that I've been to. That, that was the case. Since then, at the last UN summit, we saw uh, Costa Rica and the UK lead on a leader's pledge, pledging um, for, uh, for uh, more action on nature conservation backed up with money. This year's COP, we are bound to see, I think, a compact to nature, for nature, which will also have money attached to it. I think what we've got to do is to ensure we've got to hold the feet to the fire and ensure that this money gets spent in the right way. And it should be spent at the local level. What we're asking for is 500 billion to be spent at the local level. At the same time, removing that money out of uh, fossil fuel subsidies and agricultural subsidies. And I think this is the first time where we see money going into conservation and money coming out of perverse uh, subsidies. And I think that's a winning combination. So that's what I would say. And I'd like to say that some of us here were sitting around in 1995, sort of planning what our vision might be for this for this um, uh, for the, the CLP, and I, I congratulate you all because you're realising it. So well done. Thank you, Mark. Any any additional points on that, Christian? Well, <clears throat> first of all, congratulations to all the winners. I, I had an opportunity of I think it was three four years ago to to join the the CLP in Sulawesi, which was really fun to do. Uh, face to face and see some of the projects. So I'm sorry that it has to be virtual. Let me pick, uh, start on uh, Patricia's last point. One of the changes I've really seen is the capacity and the number of people leading conservation efforts in countries in the South and in global organizations. Like Blanca, my own journey was in Colombia as well. I started uh, doing work there in the Andes, not far from where uh, we grew up in the same city. And uh, the opportunity I've had to really work there and over time, uh, grow and, and lead a global organization, something remarkable. But I'm, I'm really encouraged by the projects and the things that I'm seeing here and the, the growing number of interests and people um, that I'm seeing here. Let me tell you a little anecdote. I just had a call a couple of days ago with the uh, president of the Obama Foundation. And they, one of the things they've established is a global leadership program uh, for youth. And the interesting is 80% of the fellows or the people that want to, uh, that they've identified for future leaders are interested in environmental issues. And that's something I think is really interesting. It shows that this issue is really very much uh, front and center. And like Mark, the other thing that I've seen, I mean, I, I started, I went back to Colombia after my PhD in 1992, which was the, Earth, the year of the Earth Summit and things. But I agree with you, Mark. I mean, what's really interesting is there seems to be a real awakening. I'm seeing uh, world leaders talking about climate and biodiversity in a way I haven't seen in the 30 years I've been here. I mean, uh, the G7 meeting, which is happening in a couple of weeks, the UK is leading, it's really focused on these issues, the COPs that are happening. I think there's a real opportunity to do this. And like uh, Patricia mentioned, I also think that 
the, the, the climate change has certainly become an important issue. We just have to make sure biodiversity is there and understand that these things go hand in hand. <clears throat> but I think um, the world is finally waking up to the challenges and the opportunities. I think it's an incredibly exciting moment to do this and we need more people like all of you to be able to lead the work, do the work in your countries and for all of us to work together to care after this planet. That's great. Thanks, Christian. Some inspiring words there. Um, our next question is from uh, another Latina. It's from Juliana Bedoya, who's the team leader of a seabird project in, in Mexico. This one's directed at Mark first uh, and then uh, to Christiane and Patricia. Juliana. Uh, Juliana has uh, connectivity issues, so her team member, Maria, is going to ask the question instead. Here's Maria. Maria. Yeah, thank, thank you for the, the opportunity. Uh, we wanted to ask you, how have you built a resilient organization with resilient people? Okay. Um, well, first, you've got to inspire them, inspire them. And then you've got to invest in good HR. You've got to in invest in good people. You've got to not only invest in recruitment programs, but also ongoing care and training. That's how you build a resilient, uh, resilient organization. It's your staff and your systems which are key. Thank you, Mark. Over to you, Christian. I've always said that we're only as good as our people. I think um, hiring the best people and growing them and, and giving people the room to grow is a real important issue. And I think one of the key things that we've done, certainly in our culture at the VCS, has always been to, to identify really good people and empower them to be able to develop those solutions bottom up. I think it's uh, identifying, one of the things we're very proud of is identifying uh, young emerging professionals, providing opportunities, starting with CLP, but we also have a program that will support people all the way through PhDs and really uh, developing those solutions. And what I'm very proud of is that most of those people are nationals of the countries where we work. And, 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 and really it's empowering this network and allowing them to find the right solutions. And I think that now more than ever allows you to be resilient. The world is changing, the situations are different. And I think uh, we really need to, to figure out ways to, to learn from each other, to do this knowledge management, to really empower people on the ground to come up with the best solutions. Thank you. Patricia, any, any follow up? Yeah, no, I, I agree with both Mark and Christian. I would say the only thing that I would add is that when you inspire pe people and you allow them to grow on their passion, uh, then you create incredibly resilient organizations because it is, it's the people who make your organization and it's uh, building them up as, as uh, Mark was saying, um, empowering them as Christian said, but making sure that they are being able to pursue their passion and that you are enabling and giving them the space to make that happen. Because then their uh, faith in the organization, their commitment to the organization will continue to be there and will help you be resilient no matter what happens. Thank you, thank you all. Great, thanks. And our final, um, question to the whole panel is from Daisy Das, who's from a soft shell turtle project in India. Um, Christian, if you'll lead with the response for this one, uh, followed by Patricia and then Mark. So over to you, Daisy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Hi, all. So my question is, what is the one big lesson you have learned about conservation during this pandemic? Um, I think this pandemic has really uh, brought home to us the incredible connection between what we call the One Health approach, uh, that whole connection between the, the link between conservation, uh, pandemics, human health, livestock well-being, and those issues. I think it's something we always knew, but I think it's really brought it to the forefront, and I think it's something that is changing um, the way not only we're thinking and we're working, but that we are uh, that the world is really waking up to this. I think that's uh, I think this could uh, turn out to be a, a real tipping point uh, for us. Um, and I, th I think it's a in some ways humbling. It, re it reminds us of that connection with nature. And I think really 
remembering the the interlinkages between what we consider the three great crises that we're facing right now the pandemic climate and biodiversity and looking at uh, recognizing that they all have shared problems shared origins and similar solutions and i think that's what we need to really pursue and to do that and and sometimes it's very easy for us to focus on our particular project or particular species and not necessarily tie it in with a broader narrative of how it deals with the issues in society. And I think that's something we can all do, put our work in a broader context. You want me to go? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> uh, I, I would uh, second that. I will just say that we have become a lot more aware of how connected we all are. That's something that started in China can completely paralyze the whole world. And it could have started in Ecuador for that matter. I'm Ecuadorian. Um, but it is the fact that uh, the planet is one, and we have one home, and that we have to work together uh, to make it, make sure that it's safe and, and protected for all of us. Um, I think the second thing is that nature matters. You know, that we are infringing and, and trespassing the boundaries of habitats in a way that is becoming uh, dangerous to our own survival, um, and that the more that we can take care of nature, the more nature is gonna take care of us. Um, but I think the last thing that I would add and just, just seeing the bird life family, um, and for those of you who are not familiar with bird life, we are a family of 113 organizations around the world that are working together. Um, what I have seen in this year of the pandemic is an incredible amount of creativity and ability to adapt to the craziness that the pandemic has thrown at us. Um, while we have not been able to do all of the work that we were used to do in the field, we have figured out ways to make sure that we are still connected using technology. You know, we're Zoomed every <laughs> to, the, to the last hour of the day, I think. But that has enabled us to really continue to push um, for changes that are important to happen. And uh, Christian and I have been part of a group of other CEOs that are really moving forward a global goal for nature and making sure that we are pushing for a very ambitious agenda for the post-2020 um, agreement that will come out of Kunming uh, when we meet there. Uh, and I think that passion and that creativity and that innovation capacity of the conservation community has flourished because we have had no other option. Um, and right now we have to harness it and, and harvest it to make sure that we can put that to the service of nature and the planet. Thank you, OK, Patricia. well, <clears throat> I'll just finish off. I, I think you're both right, all good points. Um, the pandemic has certainly put a, a real good shot across our bowels. And if you consider that we knew about these, we've known about these linkages for years, for decades. I mean, I was working on this, this theme myself for the British government in about 1973, so that shows how gray I am. But, you know, there was direct linkages shown then and we were working on those direct linkages. Um, but it was actually put aside as not being seen as relevant, the linkages between zoonosis and human disease. Um, so that, that's one thing, but um, going forward, I mean, looking at what, what has affected us, and for the one thing that we've learned out of all this as an organization, dealing at the local level and building capacity, is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, we've seen a lot of our local supporters at, at, the, at the cutting edge of conservation uh, suffer a, a great deal because they were their strategy was based on mainly on tourism, um, and that that's not sustainable and it's not resilient in the long term. So what we've done is we we've done two things. We we launched our one home campaign to help counter that uh, in in the in the longer term, but in the short term. We also launched a COVID crisis fund, which was very successful in raising money. Um, some of our partners, uh, our, our regular partners like Arcadia, actually allowed us to repurpose money to go into that fund. And we were able to alleviate the, 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 um, the, the programs at the cutting edge and at the coal face from, from the suffering that they were having. And so they could continue with that vital work. And now we're developing funds behind that to continue with it into the medium term and hopefully in the longer term, bigger society will look after that and there'll be more sustainable uh, um, uh, sustainable programs of work going on in those areas. And we'll have more than one string to our bow.
Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you for those responses and that question, Daisy. So we're going to, I think we'll, if we're okay, um, we'll go to the, the individual questions. And we'll have one question each for, for the CEOs. Hopefully there's time for, for, for your answers. Um, our first question is for Patricia. And this is from Annalise Lopez, who's the team leader of our Frog Project in Argentina. So over to you, Annalise. Hi, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here. Patricia, uh, how have you managed to overcome the challenge of being a woman from the developed world to become the head of an international conservation organization? <laughs> Hola, Annalise. Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, I, I would say a combination of uh, tenacity, <laughs> uh, good luck, um, and having had those people supporting me, you know, I, I wasn't a CLP awardee, but I got a series of different scholarships and, and financial support throughout my career that made a huge difference in terms of building up my career. Um, having support at home, I don't think I would have been able to do this without the support of my husband and my family. Um, and I would say the other thing is um, looking at an opportunity of finding help from people who are around you. Um, there are hundreds of mentors that are willing to give you a hand and help you keep growing in your career, uh, help you make the right moves at the right time and question and make sure that when you're questioning and your, your ability to do something, just push. Uh, you are more capable of doing things than you imagine. And there's always going to be people around you who are willing to tend you a hand and, and enable you to get to the places where you want to go. So I would say, keep pushing. Uh, you can do it. That's my dog. <laughs> Sorry. He agrees with you. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you. Excellent. Our, our next question is for Mark, and it's from uh, Nitin Divakar. And uh, Nitin, if you'd like to come to the stage and ask your question. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, my question is like, what are the important factors we have to focus and work on where we develop and build an NGO or institution in the future? Well, well, thank you, thank you, Nitan, uh, for that for that question. Well, first of all, you have to have a reason for being, so you have to decide what that is, and that's got to be relevant to the objectives that you set yourself. So, when I first came um, to work for FFI or the Fauna Fauna Preservation Society, as it was then, that was in 1993. Um, it had been in the doldrums for a while. There was um, probably five people working out of a basement in, in London. Um, there was very little money around. We had one project which we shared in Africa and, and, a, and a good journal um, and, and no direction. There was no direction from the board. Um, they sort of really lost their way. So the first thing I did was I started to consult people and I went to the World Conservation Congress and sort of started to ask people what they felt about FFI and what, where they felt that we ought to go. And I have to say, it wasn't very helpful because they rather like the idea of us all being a boutique organization and, and not in competition with themselves. So I didn't get any good advice there at all. So one lesson there is realize where to go for advice. Um, so what I did was I actually did a, a back of the fag packet, as we call it, uh, exercise and looked at what was missing in, in, in conservation and realized what, was, what people weren't really doing was what we're all about now, which was building capacity. There was very little building capacity going on in, in the early 90s. And so that's what I based FFI's structure and, and reason for being around. Now, and, and, and we haven't gone away from that. We've kept our focus very, very clear. And so I'd say keep your focus clear, but always be, you know, don't you, that doesn't mean to say that you miss out on opportunities, um, but they've got to be strategic opportunities fit, which fit in with the reason for being. I'd also say that another thing that timing is very important. Sometimes opportunities arise and then they go and you can miss those opportunities. So always be aware of those. For example, um, during um, uh, the early years that we were in Liberia, when Charles Taylor was arrested, 
there was a wonderful opportunity there to go in, rewrite the forestry laws for Liberia, stop those 265 logging trucks a year coming out of Liberia, which was happening, uh, sorry, not a year, a day coming out of Liberia at the time. And that's what we did. So we took advantage of that opportunity at the time. Just timing is very important in your journey to a successful conclusion. Right, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. That is too. <laughs> um, our next question is from, um, from Nella Duke, who's uh, the team leader of our primate project in Nigeria. And this question is for, for Christiane. Thank you. Thank you all. And um, thank you for giving such great insights during this session. So my question is, how would you prevent deforestation of an important habitat for an endangered species by forces more powerful than your organization? I think it's, uh, you have to understand the setting of where you're working, not only locally, look, looking beyond that. And as you mentioned in your question, understanding what are the key driving forces um, and then figure out ways to, to engage with those. Quite often it's about building the right partnerships and the right alliances with the right people. And I very much agree with Mark at the right time. Uh, because there will be some opportunities here. And what, one of the lessons I've learned, certainly when I was in Colombia, was finding people uh, that you could uh, spotlight the issue to that would have access to those people that were driving the element. So, for example, I, one thing I learned from someone is anyone that is two phone calls away, you just have to know where to place the first phone call or the first contact and then get to the right decision maker, bring them there and show them the issue. I remember taking... Uh, who was at one point the Minister of National Planning Department in Colombia to a reserve in Colombia. We were working for a weekend with his family. And that was a life-changing moment that led, uh, among other things, to the creation of the Ministry of the Environment of Colombia and a lot of other issues. So sometimes it's it's understanding those drivers. So if it's the main issues, the Ministry of Infrastructure or Agriculture, whatever, finding what those are, building those right alliances and really putting the spotlight on your issue and your mission but understanding and, uh, and tackling those source cases, which is what we've done in many places, including Nigeria, as you know, with uh, some of the challenges that we've had with infrastructure that was going to impact cross uh, river gorillas. And I think that was a good example where in that case, we not only mobilized forces within Nigeria, but outside Nigeria to really put the spotlight on the importance of this and that international pressure and spotlight, I think helped prevent some of the infrastructure planning that was being done uh, that would have devastated yeah. this incredible remnant population. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's uh, that's great. I, I think we've run out of time for, for questions. I'm afraid we're letting our CEOs off the hook. There were a couple of other burning questions, but thank you all for, for your time, uh, Patricia, Mark, and Christiane, and for offering us your, your insights and these responses. And congratulations. And Yes, that congratulations to everyone. And uh, Mark, thank you for, you've been in this journey for a long time with us. So thank you for inviting us uh, to join. And uh, we look forward to continuing and to all of you, the grantees. I can't wait to see what you're gonna be achieving. And uh, we all need to work together to make sure we look after the incredible diversity of life on the planet. And thank you for the vision at the beginning, Mark. I think that's exactly right and it, it has created an ex extraordinary movement of new conservationists all over these i don't know 30 plus years and um and thanks to arcadia uh, for becoming the patron of the program um and enabling us 10 more years of this extraordinary initiative thanks so much for having me it's lovely to be with you all that's great here here to that Thank so you. i'm going to draw the, the ceremony to a close and just want to say a big thanks again to all our panelists for Blanca for a fantastic talk Patricia Mark and Christiane for, for supporting our new grantees and of course huge congratulations to, to all members of our award-winning projects um, and a massive thanks to Kate who's who's organized this entire event including the video so none of this would happen without Kate so thank you so much we really hope that everyone in the audience has enjoyed the event and if you want to find out more about CLP and our awarding projects, you can follow us on the website. I think Kate's going to be posting a link here shortly. And of course, you can follow us on, on social media. Um, our next call for applications is in July. So if you know of any other early career conservationists looking for funding, you can let them know um, where, to, where to find us. 
Um, Kate, I think you're going to post a different link so we can join a networking session um, for the next sort of 15, 20 minutes. If anybody's available to do so, it'd be great to see you there. But thank you very much, everyone, and, uh, and goodbye. <laughs>